Okay, lecture 62, conservation of angular momentum. So recall from lecture 36, we talked about the conservation of linear momentum, and the, we, we demonstrated that using Newton's third law, right? So the, for every action is an equal and opposite reaction, right? But another way to kind of show it is that if the sum of the forces, the external forces, is equal to zero, well, this is the condition we're going to use, the condition where there are no external forces. Let's remember that force is equal to mass times acceleration, which is just mass times delta V over delta T. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move, put M and delta V together, right? I'm going to write uh, delta P, change in momentum, is equal to M delta V. So I can replace M delta V with delta P over delta T. So that says that the force is equal to the change in momentum per change in time. Now, if the sum of the forces is equal to zero, right, that means that delta P over delta T is equal to zero. Right? Another way of saying that is that there's no change in delta P, right? So you can write that uh, P1 initial plus P2 initial plus dot, 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 out to the nth particle will be equal to P1 final plus P2 final plus dot 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 out to Pn final. Okay? Yeah. So this is the conservation of linear momentum. And we can do something very similar with torques. Okay? So all I have to do is go through and replace this condition with the sum of the torques. The external torques is equal to zero. Then I would replace this with torque is equal to I times alpha. Right, where I is the moment of inertia, right? Yeah. Which I can then write as I times delta theta, oh, excuse me, uh, delta omega, where omega is the rotational velocity or the angular velocity, delta T. So the change in angular momentum is equal to I times the change in the rotational velocity. This is totally analogous to what we did for linear momentum. We can then write delta, or we can write tau, the, the torque is equal to delta L over delta T. All right, so it's delta P over delta T for linear momentum. It's delta L, the angular momentum, over delta T for uh, angular, uh, angular momentum. So now we have that the sum of the torques being equal, the sum of the external torques being equal to zero implies that delta L over delta T is equal to zero, which means we can replace all these P's with the angular momenta of any of these particles. This is for a system of particles. We have n particles. Let's replace those with L for angular momentum. So completely analogous. Okay? All right. I suppose you could do a demonstration through Newton's third law like we did originally. Uh, that I think would be tedious. I have to think about exactly how that would go. Um, so conservation of angular momentum. Now, I told you before that you know, when you get into higher physics, you'll discover why you have a conservation of linear momentum. And that's because of uh, an invariance and translational motion, right? Yeah. I can move my rulers around anywhere I want, right? So what about with angular momentum? No, I don't think I've ever demonstrated it specifically. Uh, I, my guess would be that it would mean that you can change the orientation of your rotational axes any way you wanted to, right? So instead of having, you know, the standard Cartesian, right, where we're measuring some angle theta like this, I could choose a different set of coordinates that's, you know, completely orthogonal to this, maybe. Something like that, right? Where now this is the zero degree rotation, okay? Okay. Okay, so now I want to consider a very specific system so we can see, before when we did conservation of linear momentum, we considered, for example, an inelastic collision of a couple of balls, right? Yeah. Remember that with the inelastic collision, energy was not conserved, right? Except under relativity, where everything is conserved. Um, and so I want to look at an equivalent situation for angular momentum to the collision that we did before. It's going to take a second to draw, so give me just a moment. All right, so here's my illustration. Here's the before picture. So we have a rotational axis, and on this we have a couple of uh, disks, right? The first disk has a moment of inertia I1. The second disk has a moment of inertia I2. The second disk is stationary. It's not rotating, whereas the first disk is rotating with some initial angular velocity, okay? So what's going to happen is this disk is going to slide down on this bar, 
which we'll assume is a frictionless bar, okay? And then impact this, sec this uh, second disc here. And we'll assume that there's friction between the first and second disc, okay? So that the rotational velocity, ultimately, the second disc is going to be spinning with the same velocity as I1, okay? Okay. So they're gonna, we, we call it coming to equilibrium if you want, okay? Um, so, how do we treat this? There are no external torques on the system. Therefore, the change in the angular momentum will be zero. There's going to be no change in the angular momentum. So what we need to do first is write in the before picture, right? So we'll call this initial. What is the angular momentum initially? Well, it's I1 times omega 1 plus I2 times omega 2, but remember omega 2 is 0, right? And I, the initial angular velocity here, we're just calling it initial, omega initial. This will have to be equal to, before, I should have said before and after, I don't know why I did initial, before, after, we'll have I1, I'm going to call it omega final, plus I2, omega final, these are both the same speeds because we've indicated it to be that way. We've said the system is going to collide and they're going to rotate the same velocity. Just like with the inelastic collision of two balls, we said that after they impact, they move together, right? Yeah. So after they impact, they move together. So they have some rotational velocity together. So you can see I can factor out omega f out of this side. So I'm going to get I1 omega 1, or omega initial, is equal to omega final times I1 plus I2, okay? And if we solve for the final rotational velocity, that's the unknown here. We know what omega initial is, okay? That was in the setup for the problem. Then we can find that omega final is equal to, we'll just divide out this I1 plus I2, and it's equal to I1 divided by I1 plus I2 times omega initial. Is it slower or faster, just from looking at this? Think, think of these like masses, right? I1 has some value, it's a positive value. I2 has some positive value. And so we're saying that the, so the final angular velocity is proportional to the initial angular velocity and the, the constant of proportionality of the ratio, this ratio we see here. So it's I1 divided by I1 plus I2. Can you tell whether omega f is bigger or less than omega initial? Is it the same? No. No, it can't be the same, right? Because if we look at this value here, it's I1 over I1 plus I2, is that... Greater than 1? Less than 1? Equal to 1? Less than 1? It's less than 1, right? Because we're dividing by a larger number. Whatever the number in the numerator is, we're dividing by that number plus some more, right? So this is less. So we find that the final angular frequency is less than the initial angular frequency, which is kind of what we expect, right? Yeah. Make sense? Yes. Yeah? This is very similar to the result that we got for, uh, uh, for inelastic collisions. You just replace omega with V for velocity, right, and replace I with M for mass, and you have the same situation that we found when we uh, discussed linear, conservation of linear momentum and the colli an inelastic collision there, right? Yeah. Two of two bodies. Now what about energy? So this is, this is momentum, or angular momentum, I guess. So here we have the angular momentum. What about energy? Well, the initial energy, right, is just the kinetic energy of this rotating disk, right? Yes. I'm going to ignore the fact that it's falling, okay? That's a complication that I'm not going to put in here. I'm just interested in the angular momentum component of this. So I'm just going to consider the initial kinetic energy of the rotational part of this. And so that's going to be 1 half I1 omega I squared. Again, this will be omega. There'll be another term for this wheel, but it's not moving, so it has no kinetic energy, right? Yeah. And I can rewrite this. This is a. You want to pay attention to this because I don't know if you guys have seen this before, but I can rewrite this in a funny way like this. This is one half i one omega i quantity squared. Now look, I had an omega i squared before, right? But I did not have an i one squared. Now I do, because I put both of these terms in brackets and squared it. Yeah. So I have to divide out by I1. We, we do something very similar with uh, kinetic energy for a particle, where we write 1 half mv squared. We can rewrite that as 1 half m 
times V quantity squared divided by M, right? Yeah. Well, M times V, that's just momentum. So this is equal to P squared over 2M. This is a very common way to write the kinetic energy in terms of its momentum. And we're doing, that's what we're doing here because I omega is just the angular momentum. So this is 1, excuse me, this is a L, I'll call it L1 squared over 2I1. Okay? The final kinetic energy is equal to 1 half I1 omega final squared plus 1 half I2 omega final squared, right? Yeah. So what I want to do with this, I want to write it like this. I'll do 1 half, I'm going to factor out the omega final squared part, I'm going to put I1 plus I2 times omega final squared, okay? That's the first step. So one half is getting multiplied by all of these, by both of these components, right? Just factored out an omega final squared and a one half, right? Now I'm going to write it, do the same trick I did up here. I'm going to write this as one half times the quantity I1 plus I2 times omega f. And then I put brackets around that. I'm going to square that, but I didn't have I1 plus I2 squared before, and I do now, so I have to put that in the denominator, I1 plus I2, which I can then write as LF squared over 2 times I1 plus I2. So there's the final kinetic energy. Now, are these two equal to each other? Right? No. Doesn't appear so, right? So if I were to take, for example, the final kinetic energy and the initial kinetic energy, or again I'm talking about the rotational kinetic energy, and divide these two, right, divide this into this, right, what's that going to give me? One essential step that I, uh, I left out, right? This should have been initial. Conservation of momentum tells me that the angular momentum doesn't change, right? So this L, this initial angular momentum and this final angular momentum are the same, I'm just going to call it L, okay? So when I divide these two, right, I get L squared over L squared, right, so the L squared is going to cancel. Uh, the one half over one half, that's going to cancel. I'm going to have uh, it's final, so that will be 1 over I1 plus I2 from, from the final kinetic energy, divided by, which is the same thing as multiplying the, by the reciprocal of this, so times I1 over 1. So that's equal to I1 over I1 plus I2. Which again, we can see, right, and then if I multiply both sides by E initial, that says that the final energy is less than the initial energy by this amount here, I1 over I1 plus I2. We've already seen that this is less than 1, right? Yes. So that means that the final kinetic energy is equal to a number smaller than 1 times the initial kinetic energy. You see? Yes. So that's the energy that was lost to heat and sound and stuff like that. E sub F is less than E sub I. And so this is rotational kinetic energy. Sometimes I use T's for kinetic energy and sometimes I use K's. I apologize for that. All right. I should be consistent but I'm not. So, does that make sense? It's pretty much the, it's the rotational equivalent or analog uh, of the inelastic collision of two balls, right? The ball is moving along, another ball is stationary, right? They collide and then they move off together at some common velocity. Here we've got a rotating disc and a stationary disc. They come together and then they both rotate at some common vo angular velocity. All right. Okay? Okay. Momentum is conserved. Energy is lost. Questions? By energy is lost. Well, the final kinetic energy is less than the initial kinetic energy. If it was conserved, then we'd have as much kinetic energy after as we did before. Okay? Okay. Now, special relativity would tell us that this energy that we think was lost, right, is not lost at all. Right? The mass energy is conserved. Okay? And uh, so the, this would show up as an increased mass for the combined system. So if I were to use relativity to calculate what the mass 
or I guess the moment of inertia of this is applicable. I've never actually done that, but I'm pretty sure it would work out the same way as with collisions. Uh, the mass would actually be greater than the sum of the two. Okay? Okay. And that's that increase in mass is the energy that we lost here. Yeah. All right. So we'll do the next lecture we're going to do is just going to be on friction. I was going to put it all in together in this one lecture on, uh, on uh, it's like statics revisited. Remember statics versus dynamics? Yes. Right? Uh, so we're going to do a statics problem, a sliding ladder problem, right? All right. Put the ladder up against the wall, right? We don't want it to slide down. So how high can you climb up the ladder before it slips down, right? Uh, we'll need friction for that. Um, I didn't introduce friction into our kinematic investigations because it really the only time you can use that is if you know how to solve differential equations, and so we need calculus. Um, but here, we don't need to solve a differential equation. Uh, we're going to just use the friction in its simplest way to use it. And uh, so we'll have a lecture on friction, and then we'll have a lecture on the latter, and then we'll move on to Kepler's laws and Newton's proofs for Kepler's laws.